Hello and welcome back to the second episode of Mjolnir the Movies. I'm David Yorkshire, editor of Mjolnir magazine and with me is co-host and independent filmmaker Neil Westwood. Now, hello. hello. <laughs> <laughs> now this time uh, we're going to be looking at the two Blade Runner films. So the first one from 1982, directed by Ridley Scott very famously and is uh, considered really as a classic um, of modern filmmaking and personally it's one of my personal favorites uh, and also of course this year's uh, effort um, and belated sequel uh, by Denis Villeneuve a Canadian filmmaker and I suppose the first question is uh, to, to answer is why after all this time after 30 years uh, and more have they decided to make a sequel to a film that was not particularly commercially successful. Well, from what I've been led to believe recently, um, watching the films, doing my homework for this show, I've actually discovered that there's another Blade Runner movie that came out a few months ago, um, which is um, starring Jared Leto, and it's I think I believe it's called Blade Runner 2036, and it deals with um, his character Neander Wallace and his rise to power and it's only about half an hour long but it's it's a an official um prequel sequel of sorts and um i think people needed a sequel because there were so many unanswered questions from the original film in my opinion the ambiguity of it was deckard a replicant or wasn't he what did he do after the movie did he go and live a happy life um was was he a replicant? Was he retired by another Blade Runner? And I think that the producers must have seen kind of some kind of financial um, reasons behind it because there was, in my opinion, an audience ready for it. Right. That's uh, that's interesting. I, I mean, the original film, of course, was I think deliberately left open ended, so that. You know, you you ask the question. You know, was he a replicant or not? The the clue, of course, was the the unicorn, very famously, that uh, uh, the the little model of a unicorn that Gaff leaves behind at the end, uh, which of course um, you have the foreshadowing of that with the dream sequence, and that dreams are often not seen as uh, as real but implants in the film. Um, so that kind of posed the question. Uh, it's interesting what you said about these prequels. The, there were a few of them, weren't there? Uh, sort of um, like little trailers uh, to, you know, that built up the film, sort of in the way that uh, Prometheus had these sort of prequel type trailers that, that built the film up, you know, as a form of advertising it. Uh, and, and this seems the way with science fiction films now almost um, of that sort of genre mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that movies now especially with the new alien film and other films like even the sort of comic book movies there's always little mini movies at the end of movies um, that answer questions that people want answered but the original Blade Runner and the reason why I love it so much is because it didn't need all this um, added lore to it it just was a a good film and the ambiguity behind the film was why you watch it because so many different people will have a different interpretation 
as to whether or not Deckard was a replicant or wasn't he. And it took them about seven, I think there's seven versions of the film now, and they're all slightly different. And I think everybody's got their own preferred one. But this new one, with all the, the spin-offs and the, the YouTube kind of adverts and the Facebook pages, is just a little bit too much. It, it's now more than just a film. Yeah, it's true, but I, I, I think that that's almost the expectation these days I mean we're both really Gen X's aren't we whereas um, you, you're moving towards millennial I think aren't you you're, you're, you're younger than I am um, I'm, I'm firmly Gen X and the, the millennial generation seem to need that more they seem to need a virtual universe almost within you know uh, um, that surrounds a film yeah, they, they need it to be attached to their Facebook or attached to their, their Twitter page or their their Snapchat or whatever. They need it to be more than just a movie. They want to be a part of the movie. They want it to be real, and they want it to come into their day-to-day -day life. Whereas me, I just want to sit down and watch a film for a couple hours and be entertained. Uh, I don't want to go away and have to do more research or, or, or watch like a downloadable content from somewhere. I just want to watch a good movie for once. Yeah, yeah, um, me too. Um, but, but but I think really that's sort of um, our age speaking almost the pre-internet. Uh, certainly, I you know I, I grew up pre-internet, so you know this this I think is really the last ten years or something that this has come out. This phenomenon of wanting to be involved really. In, in a hyper reality almost yeah and I, I watched an interview with um, a guy who made a film many years ago um, called Clerks and he, he makes this point in that years ago like I'm talking 15 20 years ago I'm 34 now but I can still remember that if you wanted to watch a film you had to go to the local video store and rent one out and you paid anything from five to ten pounds to to go and see this or take this movie out and take home. So you had to get up off your seat, go outside, walk to the shops, go to the, the rental store and pick a movie out. And you really want to make sure that your choice was a good one. And when you take the movie home, you weren't going to waste your evening watching this. But now you can just go online and watch it. You can you can um, go on your Facebook page and get told the storyline before it even comes out. There's trailers and adverts for it on every single um, social media site. So you can't get away from the movie. You're almost being told this movie is good before you even come to watch it yourself. That That's true, and there is endless criticism of uh, films now, um, especially on YouTube, um but also on you know there there are online forums and and everything you know it's endless almost and here we are making another one you know it's <laughs> yeah yeah um but uh, ours is from a, a probably a little different perspective uh, to the usual ones uh, but uh, so, you know so i think we we are at least offering uh, something new uh, you know a, a certain uh, different point of view, as uh, I think Obi so. yeah, as Obi Wan Kenobi says, it's all true, but from a different point of view. Yep, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll uh, we'll sort of get into the films. Um, I think we'll go back then to the question of uh, if Deckard is a replicant, because that's um, a preoccupation. I think that sort of um, ends the last film, ends the first film and really sets up the second film and is a preoccupation of the second film almost, isn't it? Well, I think it's in a way that the sequel has almost tainted the original movie for me because now that question, um, it, it can't really be discussed anymore because there the ambiguity is gone now where to take this this new sequel is entirely canon because we now know that either Deckard is a human or he's a part of some kind of new generation of, of Nexus models and he, he's got this aging ability and he's managed to survive all this time. So the, the, the discussion on the ambiguity of whether or not he is or isn't is kind of gone now in a way, I think. 
Yeah, um, I, I agree that with Ridley Scott because Ridley Scott sort of let the cat out of the bag and he said, of course, Deckard's a replicant, the film doesn't work otherwise. And uh, I think that he's right, you know, that the original Blade Runner, it's all leading up to that moment of self-recognition, of self-realisation, that he is in fact exactly the same as Rachel. In fact, um, there's a very interesting ending because there are so many alternative endings. And there's the final cut version 2 ending uh, where Rachel and uh, and Deckard, they, they ride off into the sunset in, in his car kind of thing. And Rachel says, you know what I think? I think we were made for each other. And that sort of, you know, that's that clinches it, really. And as you mentioned, there's the scene where the the other Blade Runner, the, the veteran um, Blade Runner, Gaff, and he leaves the origami um, unicorn almost to remind Eckert that he knows he's won. And he just kind of reminding him of the fact. And he also says um, prior to that, it's it's a shame she's going to die, or it, does he say that? Or is it, it's a shame she will, she won't live? But then again, none of them, not some of us, never do. It, it's something like that, isn't it? He's that's so right. Yeah, yeah. And the guy Gaff, if you think about it, he there's a couple of scenes in it where he makes other origami uh, models, doesn't he? The first one he makes is an origami chicken, and in the second time we kind of see him do it. It's right after Harrison Ford has killed the, the snake dancer, whose name I forget. And he leaves, it, does he not leave like a, a, an origami man with an erection? Yes, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that makes me wonder, he, he's a veteran Blade Runner, or, or so the lore goes. So it, it, it almost teases you that he knows that Deckard's a replicant and he tolerates him because he's never particularly nice to him throughout the movie. That's right, because there is this antipathy towards, as they call them, skin jobs, you know, the that's, that's right. the replicants. And th this is actually one of the interesting parts of the narrative of, of the sort of ideological side of, the, of Blade Runner, that it is sort of examining ideas of humanity and, you know, superiority and inferiority and... Um, what it means to be human, who is human and who isn't. And um, you also have this kind of slave narrative going on, which uh, harkens back, you know, to, to the 19th century and, and those kind of discourses, uh, but projected forward uh, into the future and with the, um, with the sort of Negroes in, in the first film uh, are actually extremely Nordic people, especially the leader Roy Batty, who is, you know, kind of the Aryan Superman almost. Yeah, and we get this um, impression uh, that these replicants are being made to handle harsh conditions and they won't question the authority. They'll just do the job when they're out there, regardless of the dangers it poses and the, the cold and the heat. The heat. Because I think they, they state in the first movie that they have this inbuilt heat resistance. Um, so they can obviously cope with really high temperatures, which I'm not sure if that's some kind of reference to why there was um, black slaves in this, the southern states of America, because they could handle the heat better than the white guys who were generally working in the northern states. I'm not sure if that's like a, is that a direct reference to that. I, I don't know, because they can tolerate temperatures in both ways don't they very famously mm. when when they kill the Chinese guy who develops eyes oh yeah yeah that's and, right and they're in the cold room you know and, and they don't have to wear any you know any, any uh, thermal protection or anything like that and of course they famously rip off his uh, suit that's keeping him warm that's right and I, I believe that they're supposed to be the, the Nexus 6 models which um, they basically have nobody seen the movie. There's these replicants, 
and they're given this four-year lifespan, and this four-year lifespan is given to them in case they start developing emotions that could hinder their work or cause them to rebel. Um, but they do start rebelling. And I believe the first real um, the look at one is the, the character Leon, um, Brian James's character. And he's going through this this test, um, which is named the, the Voigt test, the Voigt Camp test, um, which is designed to gauge their emotional responses. And they give them these questions that um, are designed to trigger uh, an emotional outburst. And he shoots the guy under the table. And you find out that he has infiltrated the, the corporation and he's working um, almost secretly to try and get to the top with means to get to Tyrell, the, uh, Eldon Tyrell. That's the, the reason they kind of infiltrate this corporation. Yeah, that, that, um, that's that's very very much right. In fact, there are, um, I mean, look, looking at the, the narrative, the, the narrative is almost two strands of detection. Uh, because just as the Blade Runner, uh, Harrison Ford as Deckard, is trying to catch the escaped replicants, they are also trying to track down Tyrell. That's right, yeah. So you have and... two sorts of uh, de uh, detective narrative going on there. That's right, and um, it, one of the things I, I, I thought was strange about it and i might be missing the point here but i i kind of see almost roy batty's character as being a little bit like lucifer in a way in that he has this this father who who creates him and he's a prodigal son and i'm sure right near where um batty kills him tyrell says to him something to the effect of um even though, like you had, your flame is smaller, you burn brighter. And Roy Batty's character um, gouges his eyes out and kills him. So he's he's almost fallen from from the heavens because he was designed as this replicant. He was supposed to work in distant galaxies at the the Tannhauser Gate, I, I think he calls it, in his monologue at the end of the movie. So we know that he's come from a distant galaxy somewhere maybe a gate to a new dimension, and he's fallen to Earth, and now he's looking for his father who created him because he wants to live longer. And when he gets there and he finds out that any attempt to help him live longer is going to kill him anyway. Yeah, um, very much so. That I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of biblical reference in there. I, I mean, he says just before uh, he kills him, you know, nothing... That the god of uh, of um, what is it? The, the god of uh, biomechanics will let me in heaven for, isn't it? That's that's the line. I believe so. And there's also a thing which, and like I said, maybe this is just me looking into it deeply. But every time there's a scene outside, it appears to be raining. Uh, is that some kind of reference to the the flood, the biblical flood? It could well be. Uh, I mean, there are practical reasons why there, there was a lot of rain uh, in the film, uh, and that was really um, to disguise the low budget. And, um, I, I mean, I've, I've seen interviews with Ridley Scott about this, and he said that, you know, so that you couldn't see all the strings and things like that, you know, and the, the little trickery and everything. He said okay. he, he, had, he had three main sort of sleight of hand things uh, which was darkness, rain and smoke okay but, and it's interesting but, but, but it, it, it's interesting that it builds the aesthetic at the same time yeah, yeah and it, when I used to watch it when I was younger I just assumed it was because of pollution and things like that and it was supposed to be um, pitching this idea that this is an advanced society, but it's falling down. The earth seems to be falling apart. It's almost an eternal darkness, and it's raining all the time. Um, but it was just recently when I started watching them again for, for my homework for this that I started seeing the more biblical references to it, or what I assume were biblical references. Oh, I'm, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's um, a very big one, uh, which is when Roy Batty, when he's starting to die and he's 
bodies breaking down. He pushes a nail through his hand. That's right. And he also shows for the first time, um, even though his particular character, and if you look into the character as a replicant, they're not supposed to have empathy. But as Decker's a way to fall to his death when he's hanging from the, the iron girder thing, he, Roy Batty grabs and reaches out and catches him and lets him live. Um, so he's, he's showing empathy for the first time. And those models, those replicants are not supposed to possess that. Yeah, that, that's right. And it, it's very much, a, as, as I say, a, a narrative about becoming human. Um, but going back to the sort of slave narrative, I, I mean, um, one thing that they did in um, the 1900s, the early 1900s, is they tried to breed superior slaves that could, you know, that, that were bigger and stronger and could carry more loads and things like that, um, but dumber uh, at the same time. Um, and Chris uh, Chris Rock has uh, he famously did a, a skit on this, you know, he was talking about the super nigger, you know, that they were trying okay. to breed and everything. And and so this this sort of uh, narrative has been transported, you know, in, into the future. Uh, and you get that very much foregrounded in the new Blade Runner, the Blade Runner 2049. But for me it's nowhere near as subtle as in the original film. Yeah, and there was a lot of things I noticed, especially in the first 10 minutes of the new one, where you see almost this instant agenda of, and I'm going to make up a description here, um, it almost seemed like it was um, anti, anti-artificial anti intelligence-ism or something preposterous like that, because uh, when the scene were... K um, is walking through the LAPD police department. Some kind of cop or other Blade Runner walks past him and says, F off skin job. And later on in the movie, when he returns home, somebody has scrawled some graffiti on his door and it's the letters F O and underneath Skinner, which you don't need to be um, a very clever person to realize that that Skinner is just a replacement word for um, a, a word that you. Um, we probably should use on this podcast, but it was almost like a, a new s slur. Um, oh, you mean you mean the one that I've just used? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I was uh, quoting Chris Rock. You know, there we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it was definitely put there deliberately, and yeah. to be fair, it's not really too far from the truth. Um, People are making up the, these these buzzwords and uh, and using them to try and get some sympathy or or, or um, I don't know attention for being oppressed, and that's what I thought the new movie was about. It wasn't really there wasn't anything ambiguous about the movie. It was in your face. Now um, this is about some kind of racial um, r racial ideas. Who's who's really a human? What is a human? And the fact that these artificial intelligence synthetic replicants are being victimized um, by these predominantly white um, people in the, the LAPD, the, the, the white Blade Runners and the white cops who all seem to dislike them. And there's another scene later on in the movie where he's going through a record of the retired replicants that he's killed and if you look really closely, most of the replicants are, are non-whites. They're like they, they look like black people, Asian people. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. Uh, I, uh, that was something that I was going to bring up, actually. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, no, you, uh, you you're absolutely right to you know to to bring that up. It is really in your face, and and you you know you see that the people on the street are more multicultural, but the people who were in authority. A white, yeah, especially the the character, the the blonde-haired woman. I can't remember the actress's name, but she was in the Princess Bride, um, and she, do you know, the woman is she's constantly swearing and losing her rag, and she she's the one that um, spearheads this kind of um, conspiracy to cover up the evidence um, that Kay has yeah, discovered. Yeah, the chief of police, isn't she? Mm, yeah, and she's she's very foul mouthed um, and she's this woman who looks really, really good. She's she's well groomed. She dresses well, 
and she's quite inte- she's obviously an intelligent woman, but she she swears all the time. If you notice this, I can't remember much swearing in the original movie, but this film seemed to have quite a lot of swear words in it, which I've got nothing against. But it almost dumbed down her character, and it almost to me made out that white people are just um, you know this these high powered people who think so highly of themselves and they swear all the time. That that's right. It was an attempt really to make someone in high authority look like trailer trash. Yeah. Uh, there, there was a scene as well where she she drinks a load of whiskey and, you know, kind of insinuates that she wants to sleep with Kay. That's right. And did, she, did you get that? Yeah. I, I got a, a few things by her where um, she asks Kay a question. Or, or sorry, Kay says... Kay says something to her like, um, I, I thought that being born would kind of give you a soul. And she says to him, well, you've done very well with that one. Like she's got no, no regard for any of his feelings or anything. She's just this cold-hearted white woman. That's that's right. But yet, simultaneously, she'll, she'll be very happy to sleep with him. And that's... So, uh, you know, it's um, it makes her look... A really sleazy, really kind of the lowest of the low. Mm. And you I know, noticed be, because if you don't believe that someone has a has a soul, but yet, you know, you want to go to bed with them. Mm. What does that and suggest? It, it suggests that you're more or less into bestiality or something. And I noticed that this is a trend in a lot of movies, and especially with this new Blade Runner movie. Now, in the original movie, I, I can argue that maybe there's a couple of scenes that are leaning towards a sort of sexual nature, but the new one seemed to be almost like, um, what are these replicants and, and can I have sex with one? The, the film was rife full of these sort of, um, like the the artificial intelligence hologram woman that is the girlfriend of Kay, whose name is Joy, I believe. And she, she grants him the name Joe, but she's called Joy. And she is this, um, if you haven't seen the movie, she is this artificial intelligence companion for people, almost like today's online dating in a way, or, or online relationships. Um, it's it's almost saying that they're they're yeah. there to be made love to, or, or to be abused and used in the most disgusting ways. Um, even though the original intention for them uh, in the, the first movie is purely as workers, but now in this new movie. The world has expanded, or so it seems, and now they're being seen as sex objects. And there's a whole scene where there's a whole bunch of them working as escorts, if you can remember that scene. And they try and um, convince Kay to come and uh, sleep with them or, or have good times with them. That That's right, because there was the sort of clone of the priest replicant, wasn't there, one of them? That's right, yeah. She, she uh, looked, and, um, and that's yeah, that's the one he eventually, well, Joy picked out for him, wasn't it? But does it not, does she not say, though, this is the thing I noticed about it, maybe I'm making a mistake here, does she not challenge him to use his eye detection device to find out what model she is? And she turns around and says to him something like, uh, it doesn't work on humans, does it? Oh, uh, right. Oh, so 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 was the Pris meant to be human then? I th- I think I mean I could be looking at it wrong, but I think she was meant to be human, and that's why uh, Joy uses her as almost like a like a s- surrogate lover, I suppose. Uh, that that's right. She s- sort of phases into her, doesn't she? So yeah. He, uh, so you could see. Joy's face, but use the the Pris lookalike's body. But what what I couldn't understand then is is why she would look like Pris. See, I, I wondered that because uh, when I started watching it, I, I thought it it was her. You know, it it, it could have well have been her. But I think I suppose we'd have to look into this. Maybe maybe after the show, go and go and Google and find out what that's all about. But um, I'm sure she says in the movie it doesn't work on humans or it doesn't work on the real ones. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what, what all that was about. Because why would you have a Pris lookalike if it, would, if it wasn't a replicant? 
you know that that would suggest automatically that it was a replicant you know because it would be sort of the pris model if you like um so I, I i didn't get that at all and and she turns up later in the um the rebellion of replicants doesn't she as well yeah what does she do is is in trying to think back in what happens with her yeah, well, she, she she just um, she she's just one of the people who are you know who are there in part of this replicant rebellion, oh. and yeah. and so I, I couldn't you know I I mean it's very confusing and we'll, we'll look at plot yeah. holes and things like that <laughs> in, in in a bit because some of the things were extremely confusing and I mean I I couldn't work out why she would also. Put that tracker on De on Kay's car to to lead him to Deckard. If she was with the rebellion, but mm. the, you know this to me is one of the many holes in the film, and and there are many I think in the sequel. Do you want to bring some of them up? See if we can uh, see if they're the same ones as I picked up. Well, what what really sort of drove me mad in the film was why Kay kept getting left alive. Twice, the head replicant, the sort of Mary Sue character, uh, love she's called, isn't she? Yeah, and joy, the, joy and love. Did you notice that one as well? Yeah, yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, and, and again, you know, with the biblical referencing, uh, his, uh, Jared Leto as Wallace refers to her all the time as his angel, uh, because of course he's God. And uh, That's again, right. again, it's so unsubtly done. Yeah. But but anyway, back to the main plot. Why does she keep leaving Deckard? Uh, sorry, not Deckard. Why does she keep leaving Kay alive? There is absolutely no reason for it. Yeah, and she she also utters just before her death. Um, I think she screams at him, "I am the chosen one," or, or or something like that, or "I am the best." She because she knows that uh, Kay has been born, so to speak, but she was created, and she she is almost like the Roy Batty of the sequel. She is that kind of I, I don't want to say Lucifer, but that's the only thing I can really think of right now. Um, so it makes me wonder, you know, she she has this this drive that she is she is the better one, she is the chosen one, she's the prodigal daughter or whatever, but she doesn't manage to finish him off, and that's just modern day movies. I think um, you can't kill the, the hero. Um, the hero will survive under the most preposterous of circumstances sometimes, but she has no problem killing that guy, the scientist in the morgue when she punches him in the back of the head and um, kills him effectively. But, you know, she, she can't quite get around to finishing chaos. Uh. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, especially, I mean, there are action films where you sort of realize that it's ridiculous, but this is meant to be a serious science fiction film. Yeah. In the, in, in the, in the first film, you, Deckard gets left alive deliberately. He's mm -hmm. saved in the end. Yeah, he's saved because Roy Batty has this last kind of minute of empathy before he has his big monologue. Um, but Kay doesn't really have that. She she seems very driven to kill him, but just doesn't quite manage to do it. No, that that's right, and that's what's... So the difference is, you know, that's why it's ridiculous. And the, and the same, of course, you have um, Byron James's character. Uh, refresh my memory of his name. I can't quite remember the character's name. His name in the movie is, is Leon Kowalski. Leon, that's it, Leon, yes. And Leon's about to kill Deckard, and coincidentally, Rachel turns up and shoots him. Okay. Yeah, she just, she just okay. Shows up. It's a, an astonishing coincidence, but we we can get over that. But I don't think we can get over this. I don't think we can get over Kay being left alive twice like that. Yeah, and I know he's supposed to be a replicant and all that, but 
does she not stab him twice? Uh, like really badly. He's in some kind of crash. That he almost drowns. He, he's uh, he has to break out of this flying car. Uh, he he. I mean, she had every opportunity in the world. That these replicants are supposed to be faster, stronger, more intelligent, um, but she just doesn't quite do it. <laughs> I mean, I, I could have done it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's silly, and there are things that are silly in it. Uh, the other big silly moment is when there's the new Rachel that appears, that Jared Leto Wallace has created. And for, for uh, Harrison Ford, for Deckard. And Deckard says, Rachel had green eyes. As though that would be overlooked somehow. Yeah. That's, uh, that, that, that's ridiculous. Well, and you have this guy, Neander Wallace, um, who's played by Jared Leto, who... It looks or appears, and it doesn't tell you directly in the movie, but he appears to be blind or have some kind of um, visual impairment. And the way he can see is he has this device below his left ear, and when you plug this sort of Bluetooth-type device into his neck, he can control these drones that see for him and go and get information for him. Um, so he's obviously that intelligent that he can create this stuff despite being blind, but he overlooks the fact that this replicant had green eyes. Yeah, but he's not going to be the only one who's working on the job, is he? Yeah, he's going to have thousands and thousands, if not you know, hundreds of thousands of other employees working under him That's who, right. are not, who are going to be clever people. They're not going to be just um, some normal guys he picked up off the street. Yeah. And I, I looked back to make sure that I, uh, Rachel's eyes were green, and, and they are, they're, they're sort of greeny-brown, you know, that green-brown mm. uh, sort of thing. But interestingly, the beginning of Blade Runner and the Blade Runner sequel, they begin sort of the same with the eye, and in the sequel you have the green eye. Did you notice that? That's right. There seems to be a lot of eyes in the movie or some kind of reference to eyes you've got Roy Batty who I believe has got sort of these light blue eyes uh, you've got Neander Wallace who has got these silver eyes because he's going blind and it, it, it seems to be very uh, I'm not sure if they're just a, a fun thing they throw into movies because the eyes are supposed to have this deep and meaningful reason behind them uh, well, well I think that the reason is that the eyes are the windows to the soul hmm I think that's the whole point of the eye references. And also and, the... And, and what we're looking at is who has souls and, and who hasn't. In the original Blade Runner, you'll, you'll notice that all the replicants, they have this... If, if the light shines on their eyes in a certain way, they become almost mirror-like. That's right, yeah. Uh, especially in the scene where Rachel is going through the the, the Voigt, is it the Voigt camp test? It is, yes. Yeah, yeah. And when she's going through it, you see the light reflecting on them, and they kind of look like they're glowing silver. Um, quite unnerving. Yeah, that's right. Because the idea is, of course, that they don't have souls, so there's nothing to go into. Mm -hmm. There's there's just reflection. So that that's uh, that's interesting, but of course uh, Jared Leto's character Wallace is exactly the same. His his eyes just reflect. That's and right, he's, and he's blind. So does that maybe suggest that he's a replicant? Because it, I I got the impression that he was supposed to be blind or he had some kind of problem with his eyes. Um, but the thing is, for me, it, this is another kind of plot hole which I didn't quite get in that if he's able to create or replicate humans and he's able to or or create some kind of artificial intelligence why can't he cure his own blindness yes exactly again an, another plot hole but I think that he is human but he's just blind and this form of blindness has very coincidentally and conveniently 
left him with sort of mirrors uh, over his eyes so that it becomes a symbolic of him not having a soul and the fact that he's now only able to really function in the world is with these flying drones that are connected to him by this thing that flashes blue is which is uh, uh, almost like Bluetooth and this this obsession that I think society has with phones and Bluetooth and gadgets next to them and phones that you can talk to your your friends on and um, communication devices and flying cameras it, he seems to be the the sort of future of humanity yeah yeah very, very much so and w one thing that disturbed me about Jared Leto's character about Wallace is how flat that character is how yeah. two dimensional again as we were talking about stock villains uh, in, in the last episode with, with regard to the new Zod as opposed to the old one how you know he's, he's just a stock cartoon villain almost I mean when he kills that replicant on when she's born and she doesn't have the ability to conceive and so he just slices her it's very hard to believe to be honest especially as he said that it's very difficult to get all the amount of replicants that are necessary and, and yet he just kills one and I'm not sure if it's him or the character Love that are supposed to be the main antagonist. I think the character Love slightly steals the show in terms of that. But at the same time, you've got Jared Leto, who isn't the best actor in the world and gives a really two-dimensional um, bad guy character. But on the other side, you've got Ryan Gosling, who delivers the most wooden um, performance I've ever seen in my life, while... Um, acting as a replicant. Yeah, yeah. That, that's so so they, they couldn't have picked a better actor to do the job because uh, he's, he's probably the most boring, um, uninspiring actor of this generation, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I suppose he done a good job acting as a replicant because uh, he didn't really yeah. have a big job to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I suppose we can also blame the script because the script is appalling. As I've said, the the referencing is really clumsily done when Jared Leto is talking about gods and angels and things. Okay, yeah, we get it. You've got a god complex, great. But it's yeah. done. It's done so over the top that you you find it hard to to believe and hard to stomach. And, and it really sort of brings you back out of the film. You, you don't get involved in the film. I, I mean, I was, it, I watched it in in the cinema, and and I sat through it. There were times when I was getting a bit bored of it, to be honest. Mm. And um, I mean, visually, visually, it's stunning. Yep. But uh, and aesthetically, it's very pleasing. But the script is so appallingly overwrought and so hammered with you know the ideas are really hammered in your face and that was extremely clumsily done but I think that this is really um, part of filmmaking in general at the moment where everything subtlety has been completely forgotten yeah I think in the original film and I'm not sure if you'll agree with me but um, when I watched the original film back, I can't really pick out who is supposed to be the good guys and who is supposed to be the bad guys. And you almost get to the end of the film feeling sorry for the replicants in a way in that they, they're they rising up and they don't want to be slaves anymore. And Deckard, who is the Blade Runner, who's supposed to be the good guy, his, his job to, to kill these, these replicants. So he's not an entirely good guy. So depending on what kind of walk of life you live or, you know, what your your interests are, you're going to see the film in a different way. But in this remake, you're pretty much told who the good guys are, who the bad guys are. Um, and it's just 
all, all the all the ambiguity, all the subtleness has been taken out of it, and it's put on a plate for you. Said this is this is a storyline. Just accept it. You know, there's no debating this. Um, we've we've done all that the, the hard work for you, and that's not what a movie should be about, in, in my opinion. That's right. There, there are some films where you can have that good guy, bad guy thing. Like we were talking about Superman the last time. Uh, and especially the first Superman film, and the first two, and you knew who the good guys were and who the bad guys were, but that is really sort of cartoon-like. Yeah, it's not meant as a serious film with depth to it, even though it does have some depth as as we've looked at, mm -hmm. but it's meant to be there primarily as light entertainment. This is not. This is meant to be serious stuff. Yeah, and if you if you look at the original movie, if you if you look back at all the characters, even the the supposed bad characters like uh, you know like Roy Batty, he's he's not really that bad to be honest with you. And either is his creator Alden Tyrell. You'd never get the sense of these are outright bad people, and we should be really scared of them because there's a sort of an empathy with them all. But with this um, this remake, it's just I don't know. It I just felt this overwhelming kind of feeling that I was being told uh, what my feelings were on the film. That's right. If we compare Elden Tyrell and Wallace, you, I mean, they're completely different. Wallace is such a stereotypical bad guy; it's unbelievable. Whereas Tyrell. He's a three-dimensional character who has a flaw, which is hubris, and which is one one of the classical uh, flaws of Greek theatre, of course. And also, you've got the guy who worked with hubris, um, Sebastian, whose first name I forget, but he's this character in the movie who he only. He, He's responsible for the nervous system, I think, of the replicants, right? He designed a nervous system of them, and he was a very talented scientist, and he created these replicants with the intention of making them to be his friends. Um, but they were used in, in ways that he didn't uh, particularly want them to be used. But despite he had this, despite the fact he had this um, unwilling um, kind of job to do he didn't really want to do it Roy Batty kills him um, he, he kills effectively his creator or one of his creators even though you know Sebastian didn't really deserve it that's right I mean Roy Batty kills all of his creators in the end mm -hmm. and this is the idea of hubris that, that uh, you know first you have hubris, hubris and then nemesis and uh, this is a, one of the themes of the film that you've usurped the power of the gods and the gods will strike you down and uh, this is w w why I seen this, this connection to, to Lucifer again which he, 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 he falls down to earth and his job is to, to slowly rise up and, with his angels and I think the term angels is used quite a lot in the second movie um so he's effectively like the fallen angel, and he's got to rise up. And as he's rising up in his rebellion, um, all his, his friends and bodies start being killed off, like, you know, Leon and Chris and the, the snake dancer. Um, and, and he's like the last one. He's like the last one left. And when he kills his creators, his creators aren't, like I said, they aren't inherently evil. They're not like nasty, um, typical bad guys from uh, other movies. It's a very subtle way of doing it, but you're right. Neander Wallace seems to be this um, uncaring, um, soulless person you can't see in his eyes. And if you look at somebody's eyes or make eye contact with someone, that's the best way to gauge some kind of emotional response from them. But you can't do this with this guy. He's He is the bad guy. Uh, and when he kills his his replicant, just after she, she's being um, born, I suppose, is the right word. He kills her and doesn't think twice about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've looked at the bad side of things. Let's 
have a look to see if there are any redeeming features of the new film because I don't think it's the worst film and I, I don't think it's as bad as some of the critics said it was uh, it is reasonably bad but it's not the worst thing in the world and certainly they, they all said that it flopped at the box office it didn't really it made its money back uh, and a bit of a profit so are there any redeeming features of it for for you I, I got to be honest I mean it, I'm struggling to remember something that really stands out and maybe I'm being a bit unfair because I'm comparing it too much to the original but even the music was just a little bit lackluster for me and I'm trying not to like dog on it too much but it, you had the original film with the Van Gallis score and it was memorable and you look at the score for the new one and I can't remember who was the, the initial or the top composer for the film but I, I believe Hans Zimmer was the other one and once again you have this movie with another Hans Zimmer score that's just this dry monotonous sort of tone all the way through the movie there was nothing uplifting there was nothing um, that kind of got the heart racing and music in a film to me is is probably the most important thing that you can add onto a movie uh, post production because it invokes emotions in you and I I just felt when I watched this this new one that my heart rate never raised at any one point. That's very true. When we look back at the 1982 film, the music by Van Gelly still still sounds really fresh now. Yeah, because for its time it was pretty innovative. This this was the future now almost and the the soundtrack has been cited as a classic and it's uh, amazing how va how versatile van gelis was actually because he also very famously wrote the soundtrack for chariots of fire as well which is completely different yeah um but the you're right that again um, zimmer he he's he's so appalling i, I don't know how he <laughs> really gets these jobs uh, perhaps uh, uh, it's something to do with a, a certain clique that he's in but anyway I um, think I think yeah. music now if you watch a lot of movies a lot of movies have this this musical score that's largely the same and it's this um, drone sound that invokes dread and tension which is fair enough but if you do it for the entire movie you know it's you're not really building up tension as much as you're building up boredom, in my opinion. Hmm. That's tr that's true. That's true. I think that what he tried to do was to imitate Vangelis and fell short. Yeah, like at the first hurdle. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. To be fair, most composers will fall short of Vangelis. But um, I, what, what uh, was interesting about Vangelis' score was that whole aesthetic that was just building at that time which was this uh, philosophy of cyberpunk now Blade Runner is often cited as one of the first cyberpunk texts it predated William Gibson's uh, first cyberpunk novel Necromancer by two years so they were you know they were really cyberpunk before cyberpunk was born and that's how fresh this film is and and I think that that's why it still stands out today even though it's meant to be in 2019 and that's only two years away mm -hmm. and it's obviously not going to look like that no. that doesn't really matter it still I think stands up as a plausible vision of the future which is different from um, other sort of science fiction movies prior to them where if there was anybody from the future, they always had like a bright silver jacket on or some kind of mad hairdo or kind of some kind of preposterous item of clothing. And this one, um, although there is some kind of um, preposterous clothing, but on the whole, it still looks like it could happen in a few years' time. They, they wear normal jackets. They've, majority of them have got normal kind of hairdos, apart from maybe Pris. Um, they don't look far-fetched. And even some of the special effects in the, the, the cityscapes, 
it still looks uh, it still looks good. It still looks sort of semi realistic uh, in a believable sense. So to me, Blade Runner is maybe the first movie that really put a very realistic um, perspective on what the future could look like, opposed to things like Star Trek and stuff like that, and big flashy lights and all this kind of uh, kind of um, bright colors. It, it took it a different way and went very dark. Like the future is not going to be um, all sunshine and rainbows. It's going to be dark. Yeah, it's it's interesting, of course, to um, compare with Ridley Scott's other film, Alien, where mm. again you you have a certain aesthetic there, and it's this idea of the future being used, being already that things have already been used, that things are not brand new like in Star Trek, where everything is pristine and white and there's not a speck of dust anywhere and and he got that idea actually from George Lucas from Star Wars oh wow Be, because if you look at Star Wars ev the idea is that things have been used for a while yeah which, which which is perfectly natural when you think about it but yet Star Wars was one of the first films that actually thought about that back when George Lucas was an innovative film director and actually knew what he was doing it's hard to imagine now but he did once upon a time and uh, I'm not sure if you um, know this but I believe one of the writers for Blade Runner uh, is called is it David David Peoples and he also wrote uh, a movie that came out in the 90s called Soldier with Kurt Russell and he's often like kind of been stated as saying he's seen it or he wrote it as a, a sequel to Blade Runner. And if you remember in that movie, it's very dark as well, and it's in the future, but nothing is shiny and clean, like what other science fiction sort of movies try to make out that the future is going to be like. It's going to be this utopian place with big white buildings, and um, everyone's all clean and nice and tidy, but Blade Runner really made it gritty. It's almost like a, a, like a film noir set in the future, that that's pretty much it, and and I think that that's the crux of the cyberpunk aesthetic, where you get technology, and film noir together, and a certain a certain aspect of the gothic as well, um, but again brought into the into a future setting, although film noir in in a sense is it draws a lot from the gothic, uh, especially if you look at uh, films directed by Tim Burton, you'll see that as well. Uh, but but projected even further into the future here. So so that I think is sort of the idea of um, uh, of cyberpunk. You 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 get those ideas as well in videos from Sisters of Mercy and stuff like that. Uh, Billy Idol tried it in the 1990s and made a complete hash of it. <laughs> but you, you know he he tried bless him, and uh, and got panned in the press for it. But uh, going to the new film, I think that it's tried to pay homage to the old film in terms of aesthetics, but whereas Ridley Scott wanted a certain beauty with the bleakness, they've forgotten about the beauty side, and they've made it all bleak. And uh, the new film, uh, it, it seems that a lot of the scenes are not set during the night. They seem to be set during the day. There's only a couple of scenes in the film, which I can remember, which were actually set at nighttime, whereas Blade Runner, from what I can remember, is almost entirely filmed at nighttime or in the dark. But this new one has this bleakness, but at the same time, it's like the, it's during the day. There's lots of like, uh, like the scene where he goes to visit Deckard in Las Vegas, and there's like these sandstorms blowing at that, but it's still during the day. So you have this this change from Blade Runner, which is nighttime and perpetual rain, and the new one, which is uh, daytime and dust and everything's like dirty and unclean. Well, there's a, there's another thing on on the floor side of it, uh, and that's that d doesn't they say that no human can live out there except for for Deckard, <laughs> who just seems to be able to, because <laughs> they say there's high concentrations of radiation there, right? That's right. So he's got to be a replicant, yeah, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. But then if he, he is a replicant, why does the chief of police say that 
you've got to build a wall between the replicants and the humans you, you can't because the idea of the birth of this child is that that wall between humans and replicants is broken meaning that Deckard is a human and he's uh, um, had sex with Rachel they've given birth to this human replicant child you see it's 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 all very confused isn't it <laughs> it's <laughs> it, it is and if anybody's listening to this and you haven't seen the, the sequel we get this this idea that Deckard at some point after the, the the Blade Runner movie at some point he's run off with Rachel somewhere they, they've had sex and she's had a baby but she's died during childbirth and he's had to cut it out of her and we get this this thing well how how is that even possible if he's a replicant and they somehow designed him to be able to have like a genitals to do the job and they've designed her to do it um, or He's a human, and somehow his human DNA has uh, created this life inside. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's it's really confusing how. It, it's, so that you get this other perspective, which is: is this a miracle from God? Has God decided? You know, these are both humans in my eyes. They're both equal, so we're going to give them a child, which is like another, to me, uh, sort of biblical reference in that. Decker's child was Rachel was not created. She was born. Or he was born because there's two of them, right? It's um, because Ryan Gosling's character is supposed to be hinted at being the other child. Yeah. And isn't this as well a sort of nod towards miscegenation that is so prevalent in films these days? Uh, well, for, for... And, and I thought that it was also interesting that the chief of police used this reference to a wall when Trump has been talking about building the wall between Mexico and America incessantly mm -hmm. and I thought that there were there were certain political reasons for having that sort of discourse in there and also not only that it, I got this impression from the movie that it was and this is why the, the original film is now being tainted for me. And I could be looking at this way too deeply, but I got this feeling that they were trying to say um, it's not up to us to decide what a, a replicant is or what a human is, and it's also not up to us to decide um, what gender a specific person is nowadays because everybody's making up these genders these days and um, just picking names out of hats and putting them together and claiming to be one. Now, the film kind of plays on that in that, yeah, it's up to them to decide. Uh, it's not up to us to hold grudges against them. Um, they can have sex with their boyfriends all they want, and you never know, one day a miracle could happen and they could have a little beautiful baby as a result of it. And that's the kind of narrative that I felt was being forced on me, that it's not up to us to judge the sort of LGBT crowd or, or anything like this, um, because you never know. God might pick one of them out one day and bless them with a child. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's very true. And as, while we're on the subject of sort of male and female and the interchangeability, there were a lot of Mary Sues in this film. Well, two big ones, really. Uh, three, actually, uh, thinking about it. The chief of police, mm -hmm. Love, who's the head replicant, and the leader of the revolution is also... A woman we notice as well yes um, so you have you so you have three of the big authority figures there that's right and, and who would you say would be the, the sort of main the main one do you think it is the the character love because she's the one that really kind of struck me as being the the top dogs that, yes it's, yeah and she's I, I um think so she seems to do a lot of um neander Wallace's Dirty jobs. She she executes the the replicant of Rachel or the sort of the clone of Rachel. Um, just point blank shoots her in the head, uh, and she seems yeah. to be this this sort of bitter character that she knows she's being created and uh, jealous of Ryan Gosling's character. 
Yeah, that's very true. And you also have this idea that although Ryan Gosling's character Wallace is in some ways powerful, he's, he's societally powerful, but he's physically frail. Yeah. And that she's, she's far more physically powerful. In fact, she's the most physically powerful character in the entire film. And she's female. So they're, they're playing with the stereotypes types of gender there. The, you know, because traditionally the male is stronger physically than the female. And they've subverted that. Yeah. And, and they, they've almost, in a way, shot themselves in the foot, in a way, that they're saying that uh, females can be strong too, so as long as, like, men cre have created them in the first place, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, th that's actually quite funny because um, Jared Leto sort of gives birth, doesn't he? You think so, yeah. With the replicant. Because he, he, he creates the replicant and there is the, the scene of the birthing. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. So there again we, we have the subversion of a, a typical female role and, and it given to the male. Oh, I see. This is something I never even noticed before. Well, <laughs> I never thought of that. Yeah. So he's a male giving birth to a, a female character, which he outright kills two seconds later. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But in, in in a way, that sort of it reifies our position that this is a perversion. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that... As, as a last little uh, look, I think that the most interesting character is actually that of Joy. Yeah. That That is my personal opinion. I don't know about yours. Well, I, I said at the start, there's this common trend, I think, in movies now, which the main characters almost always tend to be not human. And if there's like, there's, there's tons of programs out now, there's like the West World, which is based on the original movie. You've got like the Terminator movies. You've got uh, Mach Machina X Machina. You've got the Machine. There's all these movies about um, artificial intelligence girlfriends and uh, what men would really like to to use them for. And she is another one of those characters. And part of the way through the new Blade Runner, uh, Ryan Gosling's characters walking walking along the sort of rainy streets and a whole, a gigantic, like fifty foot tall version of her um, crouches down beside him naked, and, and asks him if he, if he wants good times or something. <laughs> and it, it just seems to be you take the, and she's arguably the best looking girl in the movie, and you take her and it, they've almost kind of dumbed her down into just being this this thing that was put there for Ryan Gosling's um, entertainment. But throughout the movie. There's little subtle hints that she, despite being a hologram and despite being artificial intelligence, she's she's not even a replicant. She's just this hologram that appears um, for some. She has this ability to appear whenever she wants, but she also has a lot of empathy. When Ryan Gosling's characters um, getting the crap beat out of them, she appears and she cries just before her her life. So, quote unquote, is ended by love when love stamps on the the, the little box thing that I don't know gives her life. The, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the, it's a projector, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and she stamps on it and she disappears. But before she she stamps on the, the machine, you can see that Joy's uh, crying, and it brings up a question. Um, like like you said before, what is human? What isn't human? Yeah, and and I think that. Joy's character was the most interesting about that because I, I think pr probably the the actress was very good. Uh, I don't remember the name of the actress who played her, but but I think that um, she actually played a good role. I think that she was the the most empathic yeah. uh, out of all all the characters. Um, but you and and so you warm to her because she's she's very empathic. You warm to her. But yet the the end the the idea of the you know the big hologram is that 
was she program you know it asked the question was she programmed that way from the very beginning to be empathic but, and it yeah. was actually nothing to do uh, to do with having real empathy it was just a programming yeah and you can see this in in things today um computer games console games and that you nine times out of ten a console game um, throughout the storyline you're going to get this beautiful character who well not beautiful in like the everyday sense but they, they always look visually appealing um they always wear short skirts or whatever or revealing clothing and you kind of get this sense that she she was put there as a character um nice looking petite uh she's she's very cute and she's got a lot of empathy but at the end of the day um she is just artificial intelligence she's not real she's never come into life she's never going to appear in, in human form she is just a hologram no matter what way you look at it um but at the same time you you kind of feel sorry for her and it, it plays tricks with your mind in a way that you feel sorry for her knowing full well that she's just a, a fictional character and she's a fictional character within fiction yeah Although, in interesting about you talk, uh, talking about her being a hologram, because there's a scene, and, it, and again, this seems to me to, again, be another flaw, but when there's the little model of the horse, doesn't she turn that in her hand? Does she? Wow. <laughs> See, that's, that's something I never which, noticed. Which is a horrible mistake, really, you know, because she's yeah. meant to not be able to touch real things. Um, but yeah, look, look back at that scene. I'm, I'm sure that she she it, it's her that revolves the little model horse in her hand. But does, does Ryan Gosling's character not find that same horse in in the building? He go, I, I, I'm trying to I'm struggling trying to remember. He's walking down this corridor and he just so happens to find this little clay model horse with a date on the bottom. It's like six ten twenty one, which is I believe his birthday in, in the movie. So is she not holding a holographic version of that horse that he would later come to find? I don't know. I don't. That's know. interesting. Yeah. Look. Yeah. yeah we, we'll have to have a look back at that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what what is interesting as well is that um, the feminists panned the character of Joy. They did not like that character at all, and uh, particularly I think it was the Guardian who had a screaming fit about the uh, the character which again you, you're pretty much forced to uh, into having Mary Sue's all the time mm -hmm. they, they you know they were not happy that they had all these three powerful women in the film they all had to be powerful so you you, you couldn't have a vulnerable female character like Joy in there yeah and and I think that that is one of the reasons why we do not have the quality of filmmaking that we used to do as well because you always have to be aware of the various lobby groups coming down on you hmm. and so you you cannot explore uh, character and character development or the lack thereof and the reasons for it because of these lobby groups yeah and how dare that movie take a really nice looking young woman and make her a vulnerable kind of character that needs protecting um what they really would have wanted and people need to understand this this is this is a movie um it, it's it's fictional but she's supposed to be this kind of artificial intelligence companion now without sounding too judgmental if i was in the future and i was living in 2049 and i had the opportunity to have a female artificial intelligence companion i would probably prefer if she looked a little bit like that opposed to some kind of grossly obese woman with purple hair um which is like the sort of the way the sort of feminists they seem almost pissed off that they took a good looking character and they, they made her um soft shy cute a, a typical kind of um movie female but at the same time, you had Love, who is this um, equally good-looking woman, but at the same time, she's she's really kick-ass and a strong woman who can kick men's asses. Um, but I'd like to point out to them, why is it that every single person in that movie is good-looking? 
Like, there's not an ugly person in that movie. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. Either male or female. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ryan Gosling. Uh, I mean, to the women these days is regarded as like one of the top men. Right. All the women love him. And back in the olden days, <laughs> to me, Harrison Ford was considered to be a good-looking guy. Now you have all the women in the film who are good-looking, um, very visually appealing. So it seems unfair that they pick on this one character when the entire film is filled full of models, ex-models, and the best-looking people on Earth. Yeah, and that comes down again to ideologies and agendas. Mm -hmm. And this is sadly why we're, we have a dearth of great art in this age. Yeah. And in the original movie, when you watch it, I mean, you, you have people like uh, Brian James. He's this replicant, but he, he's, he's Brian James. If anybody remembers what he looks like, he, he's not this, this good looking guy. Uh, you have Gaff, who is this, he, he kind of looks a bit um, Hispanic, but he's got silver eyes. He's a really weird looking guy with like acne scars. Uh, there's nobody in there who's like, really good looking but this movie do you know what it feels like the, the new movie feels almost like a, a fashion a fashion video or a, a, a music video and full of visually appealing everything um, and it just seems a little bit you know, one of a a better term synthetic really it's, it's all being created artificially and nothing looks real which is I suppose the premise of the movie in the first place yeah, yeah, that's that's very true, and I think that that's a nice place to end this particular show. Yes, um, and so uh, we'll again thank our listeners for tuning in, and we hope you'll be back for next week's instalment. Thank you, and it's good night from me, and it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye.